Welcome to Planet the Climates. Planet the Climates is a community organized podcast bringing you the latest information and insight into the Klima DAO ecosystem. Klima is a blockchain protocol backed by carbon credits that's fighting climate change by giving people an opportunity to offset their own carbon footprint and get rewarded for doing it. Now, Klima sits at the intersection of cryptocurrency, game theory, and the carbon credit market, so there is no shortage of great stuff for us to talk about. Now, besides being a carbon-backed asset, Klima's fundamental mission is to drive up the cost of polluting while simultaneously making it increasingly profitable for individuals to take actions to help solve the existential threat to humanity that is climate change. Now, if you're thinking, that sounds too good to be true, you're in the right spot because today's guest is ready to shed some light on the carbon markets and what's going on under the hood with Klima that makes this incredibly ambitious mission possible. My name is Phaedrus. I'll be your host on this adventure. I'm joined by my friend and co-host Reg. Unfortunately, Diamond Hands couldn't be with us today. We're going to discuss the latest Klima news, drop some occasional alpha on the show regularly, and connect you with the biggest and brightest names currently exploring this space. So for today's episode, Reg, why don't you take a minute and just tell us a little bit about why you're hyped and excited about today's guest, Dionysus. Yes, so Dionysus is a core team member, which means he's one of the founding members of KlimaDAO. He's an environmental scientist and has some real world experience with carbon markets. So I'm excited to dive into that history with him. And uh, we really want to get to know our core team members and have the community get to know them. We want to hear about the uh, kind of the background of the formation of KlimaDAO as well as his future vision. So I'm really excited to, to speak to him and get to know him a little bit better. Oh, totally. Yeah. And I think that's what I'm excited about too. Just, you know, learning more about Dionysus as a person, like what's his background, what's the story. And I think as somebody who took part in the liquidity bootstrapping pool, I would love to just hear like what was going on behind the scenes at that point, what was going on behind the scenes in the earlier days, weeks, and months ahead of that too. Just uh, really excited to learn more. It's enough about us, enough about the show. Let's just jump right into it. So Dionysus is our guest on this episode of Planet of the Climates podcast. He's not only a core Klima team member, but also our in-house expert on all things carbon. And as we're recording this episode on, I believe it is the official two month anniversary of Klima, we thought it'd be a perfect opportunity to reflect back a bit with one of our key founders. So Dionysus, it's awesome to have you on the show. As a founding core member of the Klima team, no doubt you're very busy these days. Appreciate you taking the time to chat. Why don't we start with you telling us just a little bit about your background and how that initial spark of the idea for Klima first came to life for you in the first place and your role on the team. Sure. Thanks, guys. It's wonderful to be here. You're doing amazing work reaching out to the community and you've had some some great guests on the show so far. So I have big shoes to fill on behalf of the team. Yeah, I'll start with with my background a little bit, uh, just the crypto space. So I think I may have have spoken about um, on some other public forums, getting involved with mining back in 2014, uh, mostly focused on script-based currencies. So just have kind of a row of GPUs going. And of course, that was like my first foray into crypto. And at that point, I wasn't thinking about the environmental impact of, of cryptocurrencies, frankly. That was something that came a bit later. Years after that, I actually returned to graduate school. And I had studied environmental policy. And in those years, I you know, got involved with a few startups that were in the ecosystem restoration, carbon market space, and held a number of different positions. Uh, everything on the project development side, you know, uh, monitoring, verification, and reporting of projects and so on. To more of the, the trading, you know, credit production, commodity market type of thing with carbon. And, um, yeah, a few companies in between. And then I would say in the last six months to a year became much more deeply intrigued with what's going on in DeFi and, uh, its potential to, to deliver climate finance. And I think something interesting about Klima actually is that. It's really a story of collaboration with different partners. Um, the, the founding team of Klima each came from various different endeavors in the space. And I think at one time, we probably all saw each other as competitors, truthfully. But, you know, like so many things in the DeFi space, I think just collaboration just really comes naturally. There's a lot of synergies from people. It's such a new space and it's so exciting. And 
um, oftentimes to build a really powerful team, you need to just draw people in from different projects. And that's precisely what happened with Klima. So it's, uh, it's been an incredibly exciting ride since then. So you did a, um, you did graduate work in environmental science. Um, can you tell us a little about your career after that? Yeah, my like academic background is in carbon accounting, essentially. So um, developing models to compute like the, the carbon footprint would be the classic term that's used oftentimes of a carbon account, a bit more of an accurate way of looking at it. Um, and, you know, so I did that for various uh, companies, universities, et cetera, did, did research on that. Uh, and that was knowledge that transferred over to work I had done uh, advising some of the groups that were building carbon calculators for for blockchains. So, you know, there's been some really interesting work here, a um, few different startups in this space. You know, for instance, I think uh, Offcentra has done work here. They have the carbon.fyi calculator. I, th- I believe Project REN actually employed some of the research that was done with Offcentra and a few other stakeholders on this. You have, uh, I think his name is Kyle McDonald. Has, has also developed some methodologies to account for the the emissions of the Ethereum blockchain. So it's been really interesting, you know, watching watching that develop. Anyway, after after graduate school, though, I uh, actually started a company that was not in the crypto or the climate space. It was it was actually in the healthcare space, and you know that was a that was a fantastic experience in a lot of ways in, in just the role that business can play in 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 reaching impact. Can't give too many details there, not to fully. Uh, docs myself, but um, it was a very, very powerful experience. And then after that, I kind of came back and, and started another company that was more in the climate space. And um, yeah, from there, just connecting with people, networking, and loving to see this this growth that's happening in the, in the DeFi and the climate finance space. So, how did you meet um, the rest of the core team members? Was it mainly through Olympus, or had you interacted with them on prior projects? Yeah, actually, t- to be honest, I didn't know about Olympus or the model until a few meetings in with everyone, actually, because um, in the very beginning, when we came together, you know, with these different groups, we were just trying to figure out what everybody was up to in this this climate uh, DeFi space. And through these conversations, we were looking at different models for how we could have impact. You know, people had always talked about some sort of carbon DAO. But it wasn't always clear what you know what that would mean. Does it mean something like just you know raising money through the issuance of tokens to develop a carbon project? Uh, you know there are some groups that have done that, like Mangrove DAO, for instance. So as a unique financing mechanism that was employed, um, you know, and then there were other ways of looking at it, like uh, is it is it just a DAO that's focused on supporting renewable energy infrastructure, et cetera? So there were a few different streams there where we, we could have gone, and I think. The Olympus model in the end made a lot of sense because a carbon back currency is a very powerful idea. And when you think about then the, the treasury and what's backing that asset, well, really, you can look at across the whole landscape of what sustainability is. And, you know, there's some really, really interesting innovations that are happening there, which I think will eventually expand Klima's treasury beyond just being something carbon backed uh, to, to be encompassing you know, things like renewable energy infrastructure or even, um, you know, synthetic mirrored assets to uh, ESG ETFs. So environmental and social governance companies that have high scores across those different characteristics um, that then, you know, there's an ETF fund for that. So then you're getting exposure to, let's say, other companies that have green goals. So really sky's the limit there. Oh, that's awesome. So it really is a story of competitors became collaborators and then this little seed or a spark of an idea was born? Absolutely. Um, you know, and what was cool about this is that we each were pursuing different angles on how, you know, we could leverage what's going on in the DeFi space um, for carbon markets and uh, climate finance more generally. And we came together and just started discussing a bit deeper our work. You know, I think there was some... Uh, I don't want to say skepticism, but, you know, like I said, we all saw each other as competitors, right? And so we're really curious, like, okay, what are they doing? You know, how is this company pursuing this this problem and so on? And then we started just talking about the big picture. And from those early conversations, eventually we actually crafted uh, a manifesto together. And that really set the high level vision of of what we were trying to um, I, you know, I could say create, but I think it was more so like, what's the impact that we really wanted to have on the world in terms of sustainability? 
And some of those pieces of that vision have made its way into various medium articles that we posted. And uh, I do think probably late, later this year, early January, we're going to actually release like an updated vision and roadmap that's derived from those early talks. Oh, awesome. Awesome. That's great to hear. And I think um, just thinking back to our first episode with Usfi there, he really did talk about, you know, that story. It's the story that keeps the community strong. And that when you're just kind of talking about that manifesto, that's what really became the glue to hold you guys together as a team. No, absolutely. And and it was um, an iterative process. I mean, I think we had like 10 different drafts together uh, in Notion. And, and, you know, again, because there were different groups that came together here, in the beginning, we, we had slightly different conceptions of what it was that we could accomplish. And over time, I think, you know, we came to the conclusion that this Olympus model uh, and creating a carbon-backed currency was the way that we wanted to go and would be something that was that was extremely scalable and, um, you know, could, could bring a community in to really build things out. And uh, that's really the foundation where we started from. And I think we're starting to realize that vision. So did the idea come prior to Olympus involvement and people came together because they were all involved in Olympus or? Well, there, there's a few pieces there. I think one would be this idea of tokenizing carbon, right? That's, that's one piece of it. And of course, Toucan Protocol has, has taken that and run with it really. Um, and, you know, it seems like there's a lot of interest in the legacy carbon market to, to build that up further and to really create different bridges and interfaces and just increase the bandwidth between the legacy market and the DeFi market. And it would be my hope one day that, you know, there really isn't a difference. It's just the carbon market lives in this, in this DeFi world. So that, that was one piece of it. The other piece, I think, was more on the lines of what is the impact of these blockchain technologies? You know, of course, Ethereum is moving towards proof of stake. That's fantastic news uh, in terms of energy usage and looking you know, at the, the potential impact on the climate from that. So, you know, there were groups that were really diving into that and thinking like, okay, how can we, how can we measure this? How can we report it? And how can we raise awareness in, in the cryptocurrency space? And what's quite interesting is from, I would say, February of this year to, you know, perhaps May, there was a tremendous amount of activity in the DeFi space related to the impact of NFTs. You know, some of that good, there was some backlash that I think wasn't necessarily justified and you know, that's like a, a whole story in itself. But, you know, suffice to say that, you know, there was the impact side, the awareness side, and um, yeah, I decided to, to get together to, to make it down. Oh, that's, that's awesome. I, I know I was definitely conscious of, yeah, that environmental impact of NFTs over the course of this past year or two. And as soon as I heard that idea for Klima, and, you know, that really struck a chord with me right away that, wait a second, you know, that's not just something that's going to have less of an impact, but ideally, you know, a real true net positive impact. So I, I was lucky, you know, in my perspective to get on board at the LBP process stage. And that was the, the uh, copper launch auction back in September, September 14th through 17th. And um, I know that immediately um, you were kind of in charge or you're the lead person for Klima on taking that $17 million that was raised through the copper launch and securing those carbon credits for the initial liquidity pool. Is that right? Can you maybe just walk us through, you know, how did that happen and what was the reaction or feedback you got when you were going out trying to secure these credits? Sure. Yeah. Uh, when I first realized how much we had actually raised and what we would need to do to um, acquire the carbon offsets, I was actually scared. Uh, <laughs> the main reason being that it's, it's quite difficult to off-ramp uh, crypto to fiat currency. Now, you know, th there's more and more players that are onboarding credits into the DeFi space now. You know, that, that that's a fantastic story of how like the bridge has really scaled and, you know, more and more legacy players have gotten interested. But when we were first, you know, launching and we needed these credits, there weren't really any brokers that knew what we were doing. So, you know, we had to find ones that were somewhat tuned in to the crypto space. And, you know, luckily there are some quite big commodity players that, uh, you know, we're okay receiving USDC, for example. You know, and there were some other brokers that had already interfaced a bit with with clients in the crypto space. And, you know, they had Circle account set up or, you know, some Gemini account and they could off-ramp some of that USDC. Uh, because project developers in the carbon market, to my knowledge right now, they're, they're still accepting fiat currency. And that, that's what they want. So that was a huge challenge in a way to actually convert what we had raised to fiat to actually purchase uh, 
the offsets that we need. Wow. So tell us about your, what you're working on and uh, what you're excited about for the next few months. Absolutely. Um, I'd say I continue to be surprised in a very good way. Um, yet the first big surprise, as, as I stated, was the funding that was raised to do that initial offset buy. You know, that was, that was a scary amount to us at first to then convert to offsets. So that was the first big surprise. Um, I think the second was just, you know, the number of people we've onboarded. Uh, I think now we're getting very close to 60,000 climates, if, if not having exceeded that. So that's, that's really incredible to us. Now, the next thing would be thinking about buy-in. One thing that's quite important for Klima is that on one side, we're interfacing with the DeFi space. So, you know, this, this involves partnerships with um, people in DeFi, you know, like we had the market uh, .xyz. You have people like uh, TrustSwap that have already, you know, purchased Klima as part of their sustainability agenda, et cetera. And, you know, you, you have that crypto space more generally. But on the other side, what's equally, uh, you know, if not more important from my perspective, is the relationship that Klima has with the carbon market, right? And then eventually the broader climate finance market. And in this regard, I've also been, been quite surprised by how quickly a lot of different traders and project developers have reached out and have wanted to you know, bring their assets on chain and engage with the ecosystem. Um, you know, we, we, we've had talks with the World Bank at this point. We had people reach out from uh, ICROA. So that's the uh, International Carbon Reduction and, and Offsetting Alliance, uh, ICROA. And, um, you know, they're sort of like an industry body that sets best practices and standards for the voluntary carbon market. And they want to reach out, you know, and have discussions with us. And this is really, uh, really an incredible thing to me, right? And, you know, I think over the next few weeks and, and months, it's going to be uh, a lot more about, I suppose, um, solidifying partnerships and, you know, making sure that our foot's in the door to this market as an important stakeholder and then keeping it there. So it's it's all about legitimacy and, and to a certain extent, education as well. You know, these are a lot of players that they don't even know what Bitcoin is. And then you're telling them that, oh, yes, we're creating a carbon-backed currency and it's using the Olympus model. And you can imagine trying to explain the Olympus model and so on. But but people are interested and they're, and they're willing to uh, take the time to, to hear us out. So obviously with, you know, Klima, uh, you know, Reg and I and um, Diamond Hands were, you know, involved in the, the marketing as well, too. So obviously there's, you know, active outreach and marketing happening. But it sounds like, you know, what you're talking about there is kind of, a, you know, inbound marketing or you're getting requests that are coming into you actively, too, right, with these conversations. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And, and again, like by players that are very, very important in the carbon market, I mean, we had a lot of interest from the media outlets, Carbon Pulse, uh, S&P Global Platts, etc. Um, you know, these are these are just massive names, and for them to take the time to really understand what we're doing, and then you know to publish us in their articles is uh, is really profound. So I think there's a lot of responsibility that Klima has uh, as a DAO to make sure that you know we are being diligent and that we are producing materials to really explain things in a, in a good way. And that we're starting to build those relationships to make sure that, you know, we can help scale the carbon market together with the players that have already been do, trying to do this for, for many, many, many years, right? We're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, and I think we have to be respectful of that in some ways. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, let's see. I mean, again, you're talking about these great, great conversations and great, you know, inbound and outbound opportunities that are happening for Klima there. Again, for our listeners, we want to do them a service too. Is there any, you know, alpha or anything you can spill for us about, you know, perhaps some of these conversations that you've been having or things that could be taking place over the next few months there? <laughs> I, um, well, you know, the, the amazing thing about Klima is that, you know, again, this treasury can contain a variety of different assets as long as, you know, they're, they're tokenized in some way, right? And Klima sits at the interface of two very high growth markets. I mean, crypto and DeFi and what's happening is, is just explosive. Uh, it's, it's incredible that the pace of innovation that's happening and the disruption is, is quite profound. On the other side, you have the carbon markets, which are you know, frankly, incredibly bullish, but they need to be because 
this is a, a way for us to put a price on a negative externality, and it's a way for um, you know companies, individuals, governments, etc., to also direct financing towards projects which ultimately mitigate or, or remove carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. So we're sitting right between that, and so we have this huge opportunity that we're building up to direct more and more finance towards these types of projects. And um, you know, I, I think like Joseph Poulin has already described quite a bit on like, you know, what is the, the voluntary carbon market and, and some of the things related to the compliance market as well. So I won't dive into that necessarily, but I talk, I could talk about some of the unique things that, that crypto enables. So one of them, which I think is really, really interesting, um, is the, the tokenization and, and fractionalization of uh, properties, essentially. So you've seen this with um, Realty.co. Uh, you know, they're doing it with, with rental properties in the U.S. And so what this does is it sort of democratizes access to real estate investing. Uh, you, know, you could split a, a single property into, you know, a thousand tokens and then stream the rental income directly to these people and so on. This same model can essentially be applied to carbon offsetting projects themselves, both as a fundraising tool and then as a way to uh, give exposure to everyday people that would then have these tokens to the sale of the carbon offsets. Now, you know, that that's could look like a small jump just from realty to carbon, but when you look at it just from the perspective of carbon projects themselves, you know, if you are looking at a large scale, um, you know, it could be a mangrove project or a cook stoves project, et cetera, um, you know, these are multi-million dollar projects. And generally maybe you have like five to six investors uh, you know, sometimes it could just be one company that's paying a project developer to implement it, et cetera. And, you know, then they're going to be able to generate carbon offsets at a, a specified price over a 10 year or 20 year period, depending on what technology type they're developing. And then they're going to stand the benefit from that, right? Because they have a guaranteed price of carbon over the next 10 years. Uh, and these are huge investment opportunities. You have massive companies that are scaling this out. Um, but unfortunately, you don't really have a way for you know, everyday people to have access to this. So that's something that we're, we're looking at quite closely. There's, there's some, you know, partners and associates of us that are starting to develop this and move it forward. And you can probably see where this is going, of course. It's that these ownership tokens could, could find their way into clean this treasury. And then they're, of course, generating returns because the sale of this future carbon is going to be taking place over many years. And then that can be streamed directly into the treasury. So that's something that I think is is really, really exciting for us uh, looking ahead. Oh, very cool. Hmm. Who would be, um, is there a platform in development, as far as you know, that, that is uh, working on this? Or are, are, you, are you seeing an application of an existing protocol to this problem? Yeah, it, it, is, it is being worked on. You know, it's a, it's a separate entity. Um, you know, from Kalim, because of course, Kalim's role is, is to build the, you know, the, the carbon back currency to have this treasury there. Um, and ultimately the DAO can vote on, you know, what assets we want to allow to be bonded into the treasury. But this is something in the last month, I think has become quite apparent to us is that Klima has essentially jumpstarted this new market where we've, we've bridged these two, these two worlds between carbon and DeFi. And now all this, you know, innovation energy that's in the space is, is being applied to uh, carbon markets and you know, sustainability more broadly, or climate finance, at least. Uh, that's super exciting to see because I, you know, I'm like quite proud that Klima actually had this effect, right? And now we're trawling in a lot of players. Um, you know, but again, like I think we have to be careful about, you know, what sort of things are being developed and how we communicate things to the legacy carbon market because there already are people that are very skeptical, right? Like they, they see crypto as this wild west. They don't quite understand it. And we don't we don't want things to happen too quickly and, and perhaps out of control where um, you know negative things happen that just yeah make people view view what's going on very negatively. Um, and then they're less likely to actually kind of integrate what's going on in the carbon market with what we're building on chain. Yeah, I think education and just time in the market um, so that people see our intentions uh, will be extremely important. I want to ask, uh, you know, in the long term, 
long-term vision of the treasury. So what I'm what I'm hearing is we have BCT, base carbon tons, which are an expression of the voluntary carbon units. Um, we're looking at additional p- potentially productive assets that stream revenue uh, based on um, real world real world um, production of carbon offset credits, and um, and then uh, Bitmos, which are um, an NFT, uh, a token is essentially a tokenization, but it's an NFT format of the, um, compliance market. Um, what, what do you see? Uh, do you see the voluntary carbon units that we're bringing on chain diversify further as well as part of that one basket of, uh, of assets that we're looking at? I, I believe so. And, and again, there's other things in the works. You know, it's quite clear that there's going to be a nature based pool. Uh, of some sort with more strict vintage requirements that I'll be launching. And, um, you know, the major challenge, and I think one of the reasons BCT was the first thing to launch, actually, is that uh, there was a fear that there wouldn't be enough liquidity brought on chain. Now, you know, that's something that continues to grow. And, uh, you know, pleasantly, like, we're very, very happy with that. But what will happen over time is that as this all grows, you'll be able to have more specific types of pools that develop that will still have enough liquidity to make you know, uh, trading possible and not have huge price impacts if a big player comes along. So the nature-based pools, that, that'll be a place to start, certainly. I would envision a future in the next two to three years where you, know, you may even have nature-based pools that are specific to certain geographies, uh, or you could actually split them into, you know, so let's say, forest protection, the um, red plus methodology. So that's reducing emissions from deforestation, forest degradation, the classic forest protection type of methodology to produce carbon offsets. Uh, you could also then have a separate pool that's related to afforestation or reforestation. So you're actually planting new trees then, and that's something that would more classically be associated with carbon removal. You know, you could have a blue carbon pool. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with blue carbon, but this refers to the project's with, yeah, related to water, essentially. So things like mangroves, you know, or seagrass. Diversification is, is certainly coming on just the carbon side, right? And then you would you would be looking at, as you mentioned, the Bitmos. So you have the compliance, you know, that, that whole compliance market that suddenly opens up, which is just a huge, huge opportunity. But I would expect that the voluntary carbon market is also going to see very, very strong growth right now. There's a lot of different drivers to that. You have um, a lot of corporations that are making, you know, just generally carbon neutral commitments, but also, you know, net zero. So they're working towards reducing their own emissions. But then, you know, once they actually reach uh, a state of of net zero, they're going to have to remove all residual emissions. Right. So companies have various targets for this, anything from 2030 to 2050. But these are all very long term programs, right? And they're going to be, you know offsetting residual emissions on their way to that in many cases as well. So the, you know, this is why when I think you look at reports from, you know, Deloitte or McCary and, you know, they're all talking about such a, um, a huge growth of the, the carbon market. It's just something that's necessary if we're going to scale up these technologies and, you know, essentially fight climate change. Yeah. That's certainly what we've been hearing uh, with people reaching out from uh, large investment firms talking about their existing investments and then looking at Klima, really kind of rapidly understanding it, actually, and uh, it clicking with them as a way to gain exposure to a diversifying basket of carbon assets and, um, and give them a piece of the growth of our treasury. And a really interesting aspect of uh, Klima's mechanics that um, perhaps aren't always emphasized, but is the fact that we own our own liquidity in terms of the US DC BCT uh, pool, the Klima BCT pool, and then future pools. And so, you know, my thought is that Klima is, will become positioned to be a major uh, liquidity provider for the global on chain carbon trade. Do you see that occurring? And but what are your thoughts are on that? Yeah, if you look at the the volume currently, it's it's pretty amazing. Um, BCT USDC and BCT Klima are the top two pools on Sushi Swap in terms of liquidity. You know, and and that that's kind of amazing in itself that it's it's above ETH USDC. And you know, Polygon is just seeing some profound growth right now too. And I, I do see 
what Klima is doing as contributing to Polygon being you know, the climate finance blockchain globally. I do know that there are other players that have, um, you know, they've initially started on other blockchains. They've, they've built some products and such, but they are, you know, essentially planning to move to Polygon. And, you know, as you pointed out, like Klima is incentivizing this liquidity and, and creating very liquid carbon markets on chain for traders. And of course it owns that liquidity as well. And I think that is going to be very, very helpful as we, as we scale things up and other players come in to, you know, either, either provide their own credits or actually source on chain. And one interesting uh, piece of that. So CBL markets is a uh, classic carbon exchange, uh, in the legacy market, and they're actually releasing uh, something called core carbon. And it mirrors the attributes of the BCT pool. That's 2008 vintage and plus, and it accepts any technology type. So, you know, that's, that's pretty incredible to me, right? You have an exchange in the legacy carbon market that's been around for years and years. And we've done what we've done, you know, and we've built this, this massive liquid pool of these, of these tokens that represent, you know, that are, that are carbon off offsets. And, uh, you know, I think our liquidity is probably 10x what theirs is at this point. And then they go and release a similar pool, right? Undoubtedly trying to also attract, you know, more liquid, a more liquid pool of offsets for their clients. And I think this is just a testament to, you know, why BCT is an asset that will be in demand for large players that, that require, you know, huge volumes of offsets. They can immediately come on chain and they can just source them 24 seven whenever they need them. This is the power of having a, a decentralized exchange. Uh, and of course, you know, we're helping power that. Yeah, permissionless, low fees. I wanted to ask about um, what you see as uh, some threats to Klima over the next uh, period of time. And, uh, and perhaps what you see as our you know, response to those threats or how, how do we mitigate them uh, going forward? It's a good question. It's, it's a delicate time now because of course a lot of things are scaling up there's been a lot of interest in the markets and i alluded to this a bit earlier but you know you have a lot of players that are starting to launch their own DeFi carbon you know products or platforms and in some cases there are synergies to be found uh, you know with these players and i think there there's there could be strong growth between klima and these other protocols i mean one example of course would be toucan protocol itself right you know the the bridge helps make things possible, um, you know, and Klima incentivize people bringing these things on chain uh, for using the bridge and so on. So that's that's a great, you know, win-win type of partnership there. Um, but there are others. I mean, there's already been a few forks of Klima DAO. Um, you have some, I don't know if I want to say nefarious, but, you know, there's some actors that I think are trying to just take advantage of the situation in some ways. I mean, there was like an NFT that represented one ton of offset from this Rimbaraya project. Uh, and it was sold for like 70 K to someone who thought it was worth way more or that it, it represented like ownership of the project. And so this is unfortunate, right? And it's definitely a threat again, when things, um, you know, not above board are happening in the DeFi space related to this climate finance piece. And, and then people get wind of this in the legacy market and they say, ah, you know, this is unregulated. It's the wild west. It's going to put a bad name to the carbon market. Let's you know not support this. That's definitely a risk. And, uh, yeah. What, what I found though, what I found though, is that if, if, you know, just from my, uh, my year in crypto experience is that uh, if you take your time, do your due diligence, you know, uh, talk to people in the community, you can avoid, I think, you know, 99% of the, um, let's call them the scams or, or the nefarious projects. Um, and so uh, it is, it is a double edged sword because we have uh, very little friction to innovation uh, which is what uh, benefits us uh, and allows us to move so quickly. We call it the speed of de uh, speed of crypto, but um, you know it also opens the door for nefarious actors to take advantage of people's goodwill or or you know people trying to make a quick buck. And so um, it's a double edge. But I think the message for the 
people out there is that uh, if you take your time, do your research, uh, form a group of like-minded individuals to bounce things off of, um, you can really avoid a lot of the the pitfalls, I think, in crypto. Certainly. And it, it, it's, it's nice when you have a strong community of people helping each other out. And it's always great to look in the, the Klima Discord and, you know, seeing people help newcomers that are coming. So that's another unique thing that we, we've tapped into a bit is that we've onboarded quite a few people. I should say quite a few. I mean, you know, thousands um, that they had, they actually had to like just create a Discord account. Even uh, We were looking at the stats and these are people that they're really passionate about climate change. And they may have been wondering, you know, what can I do personally to, you know, engage in this and, you know, help scale up technologies that are going to be having an impact and so on, you know, and maybe they're a bit interested in crypto as well. And, and then they've taken the plunge. Right. And so we have to make sure that these types of people, you know, they don't fall into some of the unfortunate things that can happen in DeFi. You know, we've, we've probably all found ourselves in that, a difficult situation where, you know, protocol failed or there's a hack or, you know, who knows, but you're right. I mean, you know, we, we just have to guide people and have the resources there to, to help them along. Yeah, no, that's that's great. So, I mean, you talk about the the strength of that community there. Um, I'm curious too if you would like just look back over the last few months there too. Is what's jumped out at you as being like the thing where we've perhaps most exceeded your or the core team's expectations? Like, I know you talked about the success of the copper launch there, kind of giving you you know <laughs> a big a big load of work to do. Uh, what else was kind of uh, jumping out as exceeding your expectations? Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, on the, the, the DeFi side of things, it's really been amazing to see the growth of the community. Um, you know, I know we have an amazing team leading that. And uh, it, it's been great to see community members such as yourselves starting these initiatives to have a podcast to, you know, get interesting guests on and to just, you know, share information. One key piece of that, you know, just to, to touch back on the education piece, but like, it's so cool because there's a lot of people even in the, the DeFi space now that are also thinking about sustainability. Like, you know, what's the impact of the Ethereum chain? Or like, you know, what's the impact of just the financial infrastructure that they interact with every day? So that's, I think, just a, a huge plus in general for like humanity to have more people thinking about these issues. And, and I'm really you know excited to see that further develop. The other piece that I think, you know, perhaps because of my background in the carbon market, um, the, the piece that really blew me the way the most is the interest from the legacy carbon market. Um, when we got our first mention in Carbon Pulse, I was, you know, my jaw hit the floor. I, I couldn't believe it. I said, wow, you know, we've, we've actually created something that has, you know, leveraged the activity of, of tens of thousands of people. Um, you know, we've leveraged these innovative technologies in the DeFi space, and we have literally impacted this, this global voluntary carbon market. And then the second article came, and then the third, and then, you know, you have other stakeholders that want interviews with us to, to better understand the mechanics of the protocol. Um, so that's been amazing. I, you know, I, I'm hoping to see that continue because like I said, I think Klima is the start of really bringing this market uh, on chain, making it more transparent, making it more accessible, and in the long run, uh, disintermediating it to the extent that uh, more finance is actually going from end users of these offsets directly to the projects themselves. That to me is, is one of the key pieces of the, of the long-term vision for this. Oh, yeah, very cool. So, I mean, so many things have been, you know, happening at that rapid acceleration rate. And, um, you know, the, the impact of Klima, I think, has been pretty, yeah, phenomenal, just as somebody who's just jumped into DeFi and jumped into crypto over the last few months myself and getting involved in the DAO there. Um, so we'll ask you a little bit of a, you know, counterfactual or just uh, if you had a little time machine there and if you could jump ahead, let's just imagine, say, 11 years from now or <laughs> it's 2033, 2033, imagine you could be there. What do you see as the role that Klima has created at that point in time? 
Yeah, I think ultimately, uh, Klima is going to represent an asset that uh, people, companies, etc., can hold to gain exposure to this rapid, rapid growth that's happening across the sustainability space, whether it be uh, renewable energy, whether it be the voluntary carbon market or the compliance carbon market, it is going to be the thing to hold, uh, to gain exposure to that and to contribute to its growth, right? And, you know, there are programs in the works um, related to, to, we're calling it carbon custody, um, where, you know, companies can essentially lock this in. So you may be familiar with the uh, CO2 compound artwork that Sven Created. Yeah, Sven's an incredible artist. Um, it's been uh, it's been amazing to have him contribute to to all things Klima. But you know he's big on financial activism, and this is something that that Klima has um, executed quite well. Uh, but you know this this NFT represents stake Klima that then can't be can't be removed or traded. And then as the treasury grows and as the Klima is compounding, this positive impact from that initial Klima buy essentially is is growing, right and this is something that does not exist, right? That, like companies today cannot go somewhere and say, ah, you know, we're going to buy, um, you know, this amount of offsets or their equivalent and um, we're going to, to hold them and then they're going to grow over time. Like that positive impact's going to grow over time. It's not something that exists and it's something that, you know, Klima will be, be able to launch. Um, and, you know, the, the the final name for all of this and some of the details are, are pending. I can't say too much more about that. Um, but, you know, again, this is like a first ever thing and we already have some partners that are going to be, you know, launching, launching that uh, with us. So super excited there. Oh, that's, that's very cool. And just, yeah, that, just when you talked about that artwork that Sven did, the CO2 compound, uh, again, it's something that's kind of, you know, breaking the mold of what's possible or what's imaginable. And that idea that there's that S clima in there permanently and always tracking that index. It's just, um, yeah, just next level and very cool. Um, so yeah, obviously there's so much more and it's kind of hard to imagine what could really be in 2033, but you really do see clima as being, again, at the, the core of the whole carbon and climate uh, intersection, I guess, still. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, I see it as sort of center of that ecosystem, um, just based on the dynamic it creates of, of incentivizing people to bring these assets on chain. And and because of the, the potential that the treasury has in holding a variety of other assets that are productive and, and you know, provide returns. But in 2033, um, you know, I would, I really hope that then, what started today leads to uh, a lot of, you know, novel applications of this crypto and, or I should say blockchain and, and, you know, DeFi technology, again, to make sure that there is a greater amount of finance that's flowing directly to these projects and to you know, really democratize the, the access and the, the you know, investment in them, right? Like open up this game so that everybody can contribute in a greater way to scaling these technologies and, uh, you know, ultimately contributing to the fight against climate change. Oh, that's great. So again, as, as we keep going, the, the bar raises on the technology that, or, you know, the, however much capital is needed to produce these technologies that might not be viable today. It could be more viable in five years in 10 years in 11 years in that 2033. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is, so BCT, and the demand for BCT uh, has essentially driven the, the price floor of, of carbon upwards, right? And this is one of the core effects that we spoke about, you know, in the beginning, I believe like the first iteration of Klima's website spoke about ac accelerating the price pressure on carbon assets. And that has indeed happened. That's one of the effects of, of bringing all of this on chain and, and creating a, you know, in basically introducing an entire new layer of demand on, on the market, right? But, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily end there in a way, right? Because I mean, as that price continually increases and as you bring in other types of pools that may already be from projects that are more expensive, um, you know, once, once you're driving the overall market up a bit more by introducing a lot more demand, you're making it more economically viable for certain technologies that, that may not be deployed right away. So, you know, chief among them that the whole carbon capture and storage, but there's also so many forest protection or a forestation projects that, you know, they're not quite economically viable yet, 
you know, maybe they're in a geography where the cost of labor is a bit higher or so on. But once you have a higher carbon price, you're suddenly unlocking the potential of so many more projects. And that's really, really exciting to think about the overall impact that we're going to have in the next 10 years. Yeah, I think honestly, that's kind of like the, I think we've ticked off all the questions that we sent you there ahead of time. And I don't know if Reg, if you had any other additional questions, but I think that really does kind of put a nice ribbon out there too, that vision for where Kalima is headed and how we're going to have that increasingly rising bar of what's um, economically viable, economically feasible. And uh, yeah, it's a great, a great story you've told us about the early days of Kalima here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was excellent to hear, hear that and add some color to the, uh, to the early days, your your background, uh, the thinking towards the future, um, the immediate and the longer term. So yeah, I, I think the the power of Klima uh, really comes from from its resiliency, its mission, the community behind it, and I think the alignment with the traditional actors in the space, uh, government, the broader population, just all being interested in in avoiding. Um, uh, climate catastrophes uh, as much as possible. And so Klima is kind of in the right place at the right time with the right technology. And so I am very happy to be part of it. And we would encourage all our listeners if if you have, uh, you know, a desire to contribute, you know, this is a, a decentralized autonomous organization. You can contribute as much as you like and help be a, a force to uh, promote its success from within. And so that's really what gives uh, an added dimension to the community aspect is that we have this pool of 60,000 people who currently, you know, that have talents and, and are passionate about this issue and are willing to spend their time contributing. So, and we want to thank uh, you and uh, the other core members and the other contributors for, for doing such a great, great job so far with the protocol. I really appreciate that. I appreciate what you both are doing. And, you know, I know I can say on, on behalf of the core team that we're just uh, thrilled and thankful to have such a strong community forming around uh, this vision, right? And it's such an amazing thing, this, you know, the, the DAO and, and the DeFi technology that it's able to coordinate all these people together, right? I think this is, is something we'll look back in a few decades and, and, and really see it as kind of a, a leap in how people can come together around certain missions and coordinate together and form solutions. And, you know, our DAO, we have people from all over the world of, you know, so many different age groups, background experiences, and they're able to come in. And as you said, everyone, you know, can contribute, right? And we're all in this together and um, we're working on finding solutions. Oh, 100%. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time there, Dionysus. And, uh, yeah, I think we'll we'll call it a wrap there. Super. Yeah, appreciate being on here. Thank you again. All right, cheers. All right. Wow. That was just a great conversation. And I think it's so easy to see why Dionysus is an incredible asset for the Klima core team and for the broader climate community too. Um, now, I don't know about you, Reg, but I was just so impressed uh, when when Dionysus was telling that story that the Klima team, the Klima core team actually started off as competitors. And I think that really just, you know, speaks to that spirit of, you know, when working together, we can really create and build something that's so much stronger and, um, yeah, that's the, at the heart of the tree tree and three three and, you know, we all win when we're working together and working on that same mission there. So I thought that was just so inspiring how, you know, these competitors kind of flipped and became collaborators and really aligned behind that manifesto and the vision that Klima developed. So how about you, Reg? What was your biggest takeaway from that chat there with Dionysus? Yeah, well, I, and I think the competitor, yeah, that was a very interesting thing because it, indica it indicated to me that they were all working on a similar problem but in different ways and they still uh, they got together and brought all of that together to form Klima DAO uh, so I think that was a yeah a very interesting aspect my other takeaways you know the uh, um, treasury diversification I think uh, that was new uh, information for me that um, these other uh, voluntary um, 
carbon assets, which actually represent an ownership of a real world carbon offset project that can stream revenue into the treasury based on its performance in terms of sequestering carbon. And, um, and so that, that I think our community will, will uh, find that very interesting. And also just hearing a little bit more about the uptake in terms of the traditional carbon market players, both government entities uh, who are you know, rapidly getting an understanding of what CLEAM is doing and finding that we're aligned with their uh, missions and, and how, you know, in the early days, they were able to find uh, commodities traders who would take uh, crypto for payment. I think that was another interesting uh, uh, story. So great conversation and uh, very informative. I, I really uh, learned quite a bit uh, talking to Dionysus. Yeah, no doubt about it. So again, thanks to Dionysus for joining us today in this conversation on Planet of the Climates. Now, just to remind you, for everything Klima, make sure you're hitting up klimadao.finance, our official website, where you can stake, bond, and perhaps most importantly, find a link to the Klima Discord community under that community tab, the community button there. Now, as a decentralized autonomous organization, as a DAO, Klima is community driven, just like this very podcast. So join us and you'll find a great group of climates and plenty of opportunities to contribute and become as active of a climate as you would like to be too. So we hope you enjoyed this conversation and uh, with Dionysus and a big uh, uh, sorry that we missed Diamond Hands on this chat there too, but he will be joining us again on the next episode. So thank you so much for joining us and tuning in. We're looking forward to saying hello once again on the next Planet of the Climates. <laughs>